Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Sia. So uh, we've heard lots of great talks about some very um, specific ontologies today. I'm going to talk about an ontology to bind them all, uh, called a core ontology for biology and biomedicine. Uh, and um, so I like to, you know, so this is a workshop on FAIR. I like to think of, um, you know, the, the I is my favorite letter in FAIR, interoperability. Um, I like to think of kind of uh, interoperability in terms of this this pyramid here. This figure comes from Enrico Matanzoglu. And um, in particular, when it comes to ontologies. Okay. Um, so we've got, um, you know, the kind of the top of the, the pyramid when we're thinking about ontologies. We've got our kind of shared design patterns, our robot templates, our uh, DOS DP templates, whatever your favorite system is. There's, you know, Otter, which is another design ontology design pattern system. Um, and then at the, the layer below that, we've got um, the kind of like the, the vocabularies and ontologies that are shared across all of the different ontologies. And there's kind of like three that we are sort of like generally using within, within OBO. We've got RO to standardize the relationship types. OMO, the ontology of um, the metadata ontology to um, have kind of shared kind of like properties to describe the actual elements in our ontologies themselves. And then COB is the upper layer for actual classes. And then kind of at the bedrock of that, we've got kind of like fairness and, and openness. Um, so just recently, um, we, we published a paper in, in, in database, um, just kind of updating everyone on the latest status of, um, of OBO. Um, one of the, the outcomes of this was this idea of operationalizing all of the, the OBO principles. So there's um, you know, some of these OBO principles we heard about earlier. Um, historically, we had a kind of, you know, just like maybe a lot of the notions in FAIR are sometimes a bit fuzzy. You know, we, our principles were maybe a little bit fuzzy and we actually made them actionable. And we implemented this dashboard so we can evaluate all of the ontologies in OBO or any ontology that is submitted to OBO against each of the different principles, openness, you know, file format, URIs, and so on. Uh, this is a slightly out of date image. I think there's a lot more kind of like green ticks um, across these, these ontologies now. Um, and so you can go to that dashboard and, um, and, and look at it. So yeah, these are the, um, the principles themselves. And so you might notice none of these actually explicitly mandate um, use of a shared upper ontology for, um, for, for OBO. We do have, um, you know, I want to focus on a couple of principles. So one of them that we've always had is this principle of having shared relations. So even though we've not historically mandated the use of a shared upper ontology of classes, we've always mandated the use of the relation ontology for connecting terms within your ontology or connecting terms across ontologies. And I'm also going to talk about a little bit about this principle for commitment to collaboration as well, which is, is key to OBO. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, the seventh principle was uh, to do with RO, the OBO Relation Ontology. This is one of the, the earliest OBO ontologies. It was created, I think, officially in 2003, although it maybe had its origins uh, a little bit um, before that. So um, RO originally just had quite abstract um, high level relations that be, could be used across multiple different domains, you know, is a part of, um, occurs in, you know, for maybe relating a uh, biological process to the subcellular compartment in which it, it belongs uh, in use in Go. And then this was gradually extended to include more um, specialized relations that could be used, you know, sometimes within domain specific ontologies. And this could include relationship types such as uh, regulates connecting biological processes, or expressed in, which might connect um, a gene to the tissue in which it's expressed in. So in RO, we, um, we, we have a kind of like a formal model of all these relations. Um, we use OWL and, you know, one of the nice things about OWL is you can explicitly encode domain and range constraints for your relations or object properties. So for the expressed in relation, you can say, you know, the domain of this relation is a gene, uh, the range is a material anatomical entity, and then you can use an owl reasoner and anything that does not conform to this. So if I, if I say, you know, um, you know, if I say that um, a particular cell is expressed in the lung, um, then an owl reasoner, you know, with sufficient disjointness axioms will tell me I've made a mistake there. Um, and 
we also have uh, these sort of like more generic relations as well occurs in that occurs between um, a process and an independent continuant. So the, the question is then, okay, where do these um, where do these terms or classes come for come from for expressing these domain range constraints? So we have um, yeah domain specific ontologies like the sequence ontology that might have the classes such as gene. Um, now you've got kind of like slightly more general ontologies like Caro or Uberon for describing higher level kind of anatomical concepts such as material anatomical or MC. Um, and then we have uh, BFO or BFO, uh, the basic formal ontology for, um, for describing some of the more, more abstracted relations. Mm -hmm. So this is where, you know, one of the, you know, Kind of challenges that we we have with ontologies uh, come from, and so this is you know this is something that's been kind of weighing on my my mind lately. You know, as I've worked more with ontologies, and that's you know the abstractions that we use are pretty hard for a lot of people, um, and this includes our abstractions that we have for our upper level ontologies, but also the ontology languages we use. So OWL is you know incredibly powerful; it's very useful uh, for us for building ontologies. Um, but, you know, it's in the ways in which it's expressed and the abstractions we have to map to are not always the most intuitive for, for biologists or, or data scientists. But I'll focus a bit more on the left side here, um, you know, the upper ontologies uh, that we use and some of these kind of like concepts like independent continuant and specifically dependent continuant aren't always, um, you know, immediately obvious to people. And this can cause problems when People come to ontology browsers looking for terms of interest. You know, if you come to um, you know OLS or OntoB, you know, great, you know, or BioPortal, all, all great browsers. But you try and look for terms like assay, and you start at the top of the ontology, and you open this entity node, and you get down to continuant, and you go, okay, where do I go from here? I'm just looking for an assay term, and sometimes you have to go multiple levels deep to get to um, to the term of interest, and you know, I think these upper ontologies are great. They provide us, you know, a framework for being very kind of systematic about what we mean, but maybe it shouldn't always be like completely in the face. It shouldn't be always upper ontology forward. You know, we should provide ways to kind of like allow people to get to their terms of uh, interest more quickly. So, so what we decided we needed was we needed a kind of layer, you know, just beneath Buffalo that was a bit more biologist friendly. And so the Desiderata for this ontology included um, that we wanted basically every term in OBO should be traceable up to um, a term in this kind of shared upper ontology. We wanted it to be anchored in Buffo, but we also wanted to hide the complexity of Buffo from the end users. Um, and then we wanted to include logical axioms um, such that we use this for reasoning and um, you know quality control across OBO. And that's um, where uh, Cobb came from. So. Um, uh, this is its, uh, its page on, um, on the Oboe Foundry site, uh, where you can see all the standardized metadata we have about it. Uh, it's also got its own documentation site, uh, written using this kind of like new uh, ODK kind of like make docs framework. It's not very easy to make a documentation for um, a lot of your, your Oboe ontologies. So there's lots of detailed documentation about how to, how to use, uh, use Cobb. I'll cover some of this uh, just now. Uh, but just to kind of give you an idea of the structure of um, Cobb and how it relates to to BFO, um, the, the the terms in yellow here are are are, are Cobb terms, and then uh, you've got kind of like more abstracted kind of like BFO terms above that, and then you've got maybe more specific terms getting down into the actual kind of concepts a biologist might use, molecule cell and so on, um, at a level beneath that. And so, you know, this essentially gives you a flattened view of, um, of, of BFO. Um, and the idea here is that we only include terms um, that might have subclasses within uh, OBO ontology. So there's a few, few terms in BFO for things like um, spatial region or something like that, but we don't, no, no OBO ontology is yet to use any of these. So we, you know, there's, there's no particular reason to include that. So we just have a flattened view for, um, for, for terms that have OBO subclasses. And we try and keep this as biologist friendly as possible. So just to kind of give you a concrete example, this is the material entity branch of, um, of Cobb. Yeah, arguably a material entity is still a little bit of a sort of abstract, abstract concept, but you know, we've got to have some kind of like top level, but you know, one level beneath that, you've got things that are hopefully more 
recognizable to um, you know, an ordinary kind of scientist. And you can think of these as being organized in terms of like granularity. We go all the way from um, subatomic particle right the way up through to populations. Even though this is a upper ontology for biology, you know, obviously there's a lot of overlaps with other areas of science. So, you know, maybe we don't really care too much about subatomic particles in our day-to-day -day work, but it's useful to kind of like have this, um, have this as the range of, of terms. And so we've included some examples here of, of actual specific terms that, you know, these are not actually in Cobb itself. We don't actually have nickel or aspirin or actin or anything like that, but this is just to show you how these would be, uh, would be classified. Um, so some other branches as well, uh, if we move out of the material entity branch of Cobb, uh, we've got terms like process, site, quality, realizable entity, information. Yeah, some of these are maybe still a little bit abstracted from, from my tastes, but again, it's just, this is just one level at the top. And from here you go down to um, hopefully more familiar kind of like concepts, biological processes, plant um, processes, you know, qualities like mass and color, um, and then information entities such as uh, documents and so on. So, um, yeah, so one thing, um, you know, one thing this kind of like, you know, helps us with is kind of, sort of like disambiguating kind of like terms that may be ambiguous, you know, such as nucleus or, or vector, you know, this, um, you know, the idea is this becomes kind of very, very kind of explicit with, with Cobb. So you've got kind of atomic nucleus, cell nucleus, nucleus of brain, uh, different senses of the, the term vector. Um, and um, so I want to switch to talking now about how Cobb relates to some existing terms, and in particular the top level terms within, um, within Oboe. So we naturally, you know, in Oboe we strive for orthogonality. You know, there should be only one ontology dealing with cells, only one ontology dealing with biological processes. Cobb by its nature, you know, has to overlap a bit with the top levels of some existing ontologies. So we to try and kind of like maintain these relationships in a very systematic um, fashion. Um, so um, just to kind of give you, give you some examples, um, you know, Cobb will have the concept of cell, and then we explicitly note that this is precisely equivalent to the concept of cell that's in the cell ontology. Uh, we don't always use the same labels. So in Cobb, we opted for you know, using the string information as the primary label for what IAO calls uh, information content entity, sometimes abbreviated as ICE. Um, and then it's not always the case that we can find um, equivalents. Um, so our concept of atom in Cobb does not precisely correspond to the concept of atom in Kebby. I won't really kind of go into the reasons for that today. There's kind of like, you know, some quite nuanced issues when, when representing uh, and chemistry and the way with the Kebby deals with some of these things. But um, we actually avoid placing an explicit equivalence axiom there. Um, and so what we actually do is we maintain a table um, that relates um, the Cobb concepts to these top level concepts in a format called SSSOM, Simple Standard for Sharing Ontology Mappings. Uh, this is, if you're not familiar with this already, I recommend this um, as a, a standard way of kind of like mapping your ontology terms or other kind of like objects uh, together. It helps provide very explicit semantics about what you mean by a mapping. So you can see some of the, the mappings we have here between Cobb concepts like mass and uh, the concept in, uh, in the Peto ontology. Now, even though Oboe strives to be orthogonal, it's not always the case that you have one uh, one single ob obo ID for any one Cobb ID. So, um, you know, the concept of, of organism in Cobb, and we debated long and hard about organisms and does organisms include viruses or does it not include viruses? The consensus was it, it, it does. Um, and so we've, we kind of like say this is, this is equivalent to the root node of the NCBI taxonomy, which annoyingly is called root, uh, which is very confusing because it's talking about abstract tree concepts and not actual organisms. But anyway, it more or less corresponds to, I mean, it, you could say the equivalent axiom there is not quite right because NCBI taxon has some odd entities within it, you know, to do with like metagenomic samples and so on. But anyway, let's ignore that for now. Um, it's also, you know, for a while, Obi had a kind of placeholder class for or organism that it had in its own ontology. It will likely now obsolete that and make use of the Cobb concept. Um, same with the, uh, the Caro concept of 
organism or virus or viroid. Um, where we can't place an actual equivalence axiom, we'll place, um, we'll use some other kind of like predicate um, and we are as precise as we can be. So, um, you know, there's ontologies like the plant ontology that will have a concept like plant cell, which somewhat obviously is actually not the same thing as the cell concept. It's a subclass, it's a plant, it's a cell that's in a plant. Same with some of these other kind of like species, um, uh, species specific ontologies. Um, and sometimes we just, we're just not able to make an explicit commitment. So, uh, you know, Cobb's concepts like atom and molecular entity, the only loosely correspond to the same the same concepts in Kebby. When we try and make these equivalents, then we actually get um, you know um, unsatisfiable classes when we run our, our reasoner pipeline. And this is an ongoing thing that we're kind of like attempting to 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 resolve here. But just to really emphasize um, openness here. Um, you know, this, this mapping file, it's there in GitHub. Anyone can come along and make uh, pull requests. This is a pull request from uh, Charlie Hoyt, who's not really part of the Cobb group, but he was very interested in seeing some of these mappings being made uh, com uh, complete. So, you know, he came along and kind of like just using the GitHub uh, web interface and just kind of like provided some, some additional mappings here, which is very useful and very welcome. So we welcome all kind of like uh, all contributions from, from everyone. So um, when we actually make the, um, the, the Cobb release uh, file, what we actually do is we, um, we, where we do have equivalents, we swap these out for existing OBO IDs. So it means that if you look at Cobb on OLS or onto B, you'll see maybe uh, a mixture of IDs, a mixture of Cobb IDs, but maybe a mixture of IDs that are taken from other ontologies as well where we have a kind of designated re representative for that, for that class. So again, we only do this for concepts that are um, equivalent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just, um, you know, Cobb is still very much a work in progress. Uh, I'll highlight a few areas where we are, you know, still having challenges and kind of like, you know, actively working to, to achieve consensus, you know, and just to emphasize again, we're not doing this. This isn't some small cabal doing this in a, in a vacuum. We've had a number of kind of like workshops where we bring together both the, the broad OBO community and kind of like representatives from different ontologies like Kebby, anatomy ontologies. Um, just takes a lot of time. So we're not quite there yet. One area where we still have work to do is um, you know, unifying the kind of upper level concepts we need for phenotype and disease. And unfortunately, the um, the existing kind of abstractions that we, we use, you know, dispositions, biological processes, material entities, doesn't really map so well to a lot of how the developers of disease and phenotype ontologies think of, um, think of the concepts they have under, under, their, um, under their domain. And, um, you know, I'm actually a big fan of what I kind of call the, uh, the Schultz conflation mo model after this paper from uh, Stefan Schultz. We kind of provided a methodology for essentially, you know, conflating some of these different distinctions and having um, union classes, but that's certainly not the consensus yet. So there's a lot of ongoing, uh, ongoing discussion on how to do this. Um, and another area that we're actively working on is, um, you know, a unified representation of units and, and measurements. So um, there's been a kind of de facto standard for how you do measurements within um, OBO. You know, it's representing this OB documentation here. There's maybe a, a little bit kind of like over abstracted and, co and complex. So we're working on a kind of like, um, you know, a simplified model of this and also kind of like thinking, you know, of what the, what the ontology that we should be using for, for units um, should be. And then um, finally, I'm also kind of wearing um, you know, a separate hat, you know, outside my, um, my kind of like OBO um, kind of ontology type world. I'm part of this NCATS data translator project. And what we're trying to do is kind of like essentially build a knowledge graph standard that allows multiple different bioinformatics groups to build a kind of federated system that's able to answer uh, questions about translational medicine. And this group really needed to come up with a standard way of unifying knowledge graphs and do it in a very quick, fast, uh, with a very quick, fast turnaround. Um, and, you know, at that stage, Cobb wasn't quite ready and it still had a lot of kind of abstractions or maybe not super intuitive to a lot of 
you know, kind of uh, the bioinformaticians on the project. So we kind of came up with more, not really ontology, but more of a kind of knowledge graph schema called, uh, called BioLink. Uh, you can browse this on BioPortal. It's not really an OBO ontology. It doesn't quite conform to OBO principles, but it's designed to be, you know, an even more sort of like biologist friendly way of kind of like, you know, thinking about things. So it's got, you know, um, it, you know, we've included chemical entities and diseases and phenotypes without necessarily thinking deep, too deeply about how to, how to ontologize these in terms of like dispositions and so on. So there's still ongoing work to kind of like, you know, align this kind of more ontological and this more knowledge graph way of, uh, of thinking about the world. So with that, I'll just leave up um, a couple of links uh, to our website, our issue tracker, um, and how you can reach, uh, find out more about COB from the OBO pages. And just want to thank um, you know, um, the, all the contributors to, to COB, um, including the kind of like uh, core development team, Bjorn, uh, James Overton, and Becky, Becky Jackson. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions. around here. Um, so there's a very famous experience in the comic which says, okay, we have these four things. Sure. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to harmonize everything and end result is we created a complete model. Right? Yeah. That's used very commonly as to why we should not be creating these kind of things. So this seems like exactly that kind of a situation where you've created a new one to unify some things. And we've minted new URIs for uh, a lot of ones that are already existing. So I'm a little concerned that because it's playing to that, that comic. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very familiar with that. And I'm familiar with, uh, yeah, that, that particular problem. But I'm, I'm going to push back a little bit there because I don't think it really applies in this case. I mean, it does in some extent because I, I actually, due to time constraints, I didn't go into all the other ontologies there um you know things like biotop um sio and so on so that's you know um i think your comment definitely speaks to 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 that but i just want to address specifically your concern about you know making new ids for these existing ids so one thing that we should be very clear about is when we can provide an equivalence mapping between a cob id and um and the obo id then that obo id gets used in the actual COB release. So in some ways, COB is just an, a, a subset of exist, the top bits of existing OBO ontologies with gaps filled where we can find an OBO ontology for that yet. So it's working very much within the OBO spirit and the OBO spirit of reuse and orthogonality and so on. And it's, it's maybe not obvious to everyone because the way we started with COB is we just made our own IDs because we needed to develop this independently and kind of move things around but then we're now in the process of kind of like, you know, aligning it and actually reusing kind of OBO IDs in there. Follow-up question. Mm -hmm. So an alternative model would be to, to do cross maps between the different ontologies, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of the ontologies. You're not building an actual ontology, but providing cross maps, again, as modules that you can use. In which case you're not making new URIs, right? So any, of using that kind of an approach. I mean, we, we are to some extent. So this, you know, the this mapping, you know, there's a just in very concrete terms. There's this TSV file that exists in the Git, GitHub repo that is exactly that. It's just this set of kind of like cross mappings from from Cob mm -hmm. concepts to to Obo concepts. But there is there is a need to kind of like do that in concert with a more top down approach where you say, okay after analyzing all of the different ways people in OBO have kind of like talked about cells or diseases or so on, let's try and build this one kind of coherent kind of like top level ontology and then refine it and then work with these groups and kind of like, you know, come up with, with unified concepts for these. Thank you. There is a question on asking okay. why, why not use file Maria, can you? Um, okay, yeah, um, I think that's a really good question, uh, Maria. Um, so um, I think you know back in the you know back in the 
early days of Cobb, we did, you know, we did actually kind of include more kind of like um, specific alignments with with Biotop. I, you know, I think I, this is something we should definitely kind of like revisit again, and not just not just Biotop. There's also Michelle de Montier's kind of like SIO, um, you know, ontology as well. And some of it is just it's actually just a kind of like you know a lack of time. You know, when we it would be more work to take something like Biotop that you know was so bifurcated, I think, from you know some of the way some of the oboe ontologies do things at an early stage. But you know, I highlighted the Schultz kind of conflation model and and Biotop, and I think that is actually some of the ideas in Biotop are, are really key to being able to kind of like you know solve some of these long-standing challenges that we have in uh, in COB. No more questions? On there. I have two questions. Um, okay. One follow up here. Um, I, so, when you first started this, I, I was wondering I said, man, why ontology and not some kind of filter view? Um, so, like, it's the line to go with that. So, that, that's one. I think you probably have an answer to that. Uh, two, um, I see in the slide that you start, you know, some of the motivation was um, like this higher level of track class was kind of confusing. And yet, mm -hmm. uh, highlighted in yellow, real as well. Um, that's good. <laughs> but, but how, how can you stop there um, instead of maybe explore like maybe this role or something and quality? Yeah, no, point taken. So, you know, to your first question. Um, I think a lot of the, the challenges that we have with kind of like, you know, the very upper level concepts can be addressed with ontology views. The thing is, people have been saying this since the early days and, you know, it takes engineering and effort and coordination to kind of like come up with those ways. And the abstractions always leak out in the end, you know, but with, having said that, I think uh, I want to credit like the, I think the developers of like OLS, they now have a way of aligning your ontology to say what you know what the top levels uh what your preferred top levels are not enough people are using that but if you do use that then you go to OLS and you see those and there's an open issue in onto be as well to do to do the same thing so i think gradually we will get there and we'll have better views for this kind of thing but the abstractions still leak out to your second point i i fully agree i don't i i would like to see, you know, I, I don't want to see the realizable entity in COB. I want to go one level deeper. <laughs> it's not to say it's not a useful abstraction for reasoning about, but it doesn't need to be front and center. Uh, 